Oh, welcome back to Way of the Master, class number 14. Uh, so let me start with this quote by Scott Hinkle. If you, you don't have to be perfect to share the love of Christ with someone, but you do have to be pursuing a right relationship with God. And if you are not, your witnessing will be ineffective. And that's what it's really all about. You know, we, we need to make sure our relationship with Jesus is right, because if it's not, how are we going to be able to share how great he is to us if we're not in a great relationship with him? How are we going to convince someone that he's the most important thing in their life? So make sure, as always, that Jesus is number one in your life and that you're having this amazing relationship each week, each, not each week, each day uh, with him. You know, one of our four things this year that we're doing is we want to ask us every day, what would Jesus do? If you do that, You'll be starting a conversation with Jesus every single day uh, to help you with everything that happens in your life. So let's uh, continue with, uh, with uh, Ray Comfort's um, the School of Biblical Evangelism. Jesus told his disciples that when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they would receive power, and the result would be that they would be his witnesses. These are his words. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll be my witnesses in, Jer in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the world. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Notice they were not told to be Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> kind of funny. and Because if we have received the Holy Spirit, we will be witnesses of who? Of Jesus Christ and what he is, what he did, and what he means to us. We speak of him, think of him, love him, and want to obey his words because he is our Lord, our personal Savior. Jesus told the disciples that the Holy Spirit would speak of him. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. John 15, 26. Therefore, someone who received the Holy Spirit should be Christ-centered. In fact, the Bible has a sober warning for us. If we are not, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. 1 Corinthians 16, 22. After Jesus returned to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell believers, just as he said he would. God kept his promise to rescue humanity from death. Pentecost was the giving of the life of the Spirit to humanity. The Messiah had suffered and died, and his body was placed in the grave. Three days later, in the deathly coldness of the darkened tomb, a faint sound was heard. It was the sound of a human heartbeat within the frigid and lifeless corpse of Jesus of Nazareth. And that one tiny sound brought with it implications that resounded in thunder throughout all the universe. The Father had accepted the Son's sacrifice. Death had lost its sting. Jesus burst from the grave, holding the keys to death and hell. And all that was necessary was for disciples to take this message of eternal life to those who were sitting in the shadow of death. However, there was a problem. His disciples were frozen with fear. Despite three years of intense training with Jesus, they ran in the, fa they ran in the face of danger. They had been given the keys to the kingdom, but they, had, but they hid behind locked doors. They needed power from on high. When the Holy Spirit was poured out of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, the immediate result was that the fearful disciples became fearless. They were empowered to be witnesses. They didn't remain inside and have a time of worship, nor did they stay for a time of fellowship or, car or carpet the room and invite the world in. They went out. The gas was in the tank. The spark had ignited the flame. The power was there, and they put their foot down and headed in the direction of the unsaved. In James 3, 6, we are told, the tongue is set on fire by hell. At Pentecost, God gave man a new tongue set on fire by heaven. It is evidence in contemporary Christendom that many who profess to have the power of the Holy Spirit have not have had the same experience as disciples. They shake, they quiver, they ran over, they're still hiding inside. As Bill Bright found, only 2% of believers in America regularly share their faith with Christ with others. How could anyone who complains they possess the power of the witness not be a witness of Jesus? If you are a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit living in you. But are you filled with the Spirit? Are you filled to overflowing? Are you like the fearful disciples of Pentecost? Are you like the faith-filled disciples after that day? Are you war warning sinners about the wrath that is to come, which is the only thing that will matter on Judgment Day? Evangelistic zeal is evidence of the Holy Spirit's presence and power. If fear is pre prevalent when it comes to sharing your faith, perhaps you need to be filled with the Spirit, something you and I are commanded to be. See Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. How do you do that? You must be emptied of yourself and then say, God, just take over. And he comes in and he fills you and, and, and he gives you a, a prayer language. And what's that for? It, it, it's so you can have, it's so God, the Holy Spirit can pray for what you actually need. And you hear what's happening and you know God hears. And then by the witness of two or three people, you, the Holy Spirit and God, all things are established so God can help you. So you don't have to be fearful, but you can be what? Fearless in everything, which will help you win the loss. Because you know, what's one of the most awkward things to do is go up and share your faith with, uh, uh, with someone else about Jesus. 
Because the devil wants you to be fearful. He wants you to think what they'll think. But you know what? We need to have that fear gone. That's what the Holy Spirit does in your life. And he's there to help you, protect you, and let you do some amazing things. Let the Holy Spirit dwell in your life today. Dwell of him at all times and see how your life will change. Who wants to be afraid of things? You know, God doesn't want you. He wants you to be fearless. You know what? It's easy for us to invite someone out to a movie or to go to dinner or to come over our house and play a game. Shouldn't it be just as easy as to share who Jesus is and how much he means to us? Remember, you don't have to tell them who he is. You just need to show them how important he is to you. Our second chapter today says this. Uh, how, how do we capture the world's attention? Abraham Lincoln said this, Surely God would not have created such a being as man with an ability to grasp the infinite to exist only for a day. No, man was made for immortality. We were made forever. God wants to be with you forever. He wants everybody to be with ever. And he gave us a brain so we can figure out, say, there must be something more. And Jesus is that something more. And he wants to bring so much more into your life. You know, millions of people spend dozens of hours each week watching uh, dead people on TV. From Elvis to Lucy to Jimmy Stewart, the faces of folks who no longer exist entertain us. Time not only snatched their looks, it snatched their lives. Today, good-looking Hollywood stars are making movies that tomorrow's generation can also pass the time by watching dead people on TV. Time makes today's money, today's memory, uh, to, to time makes today tomorrow's memory. Weeks seem to pass by us like blurred telephone poles flashing past the window of a speeding train called life. Before uh, my conversion, uh, uh, Brother Com Comfort says, I had thoughts that I was compelled to keep to myself. I would think, it makes no sense that the whole of humanity is headed for death. Instead of seeking a cure to the aging process, we are searching for intelligent life in space or for a cure to the common cold. No one seems concerned about the big problem. No one even talks about death. But now that I have found God, he has provided a cure, salvation through Jesus Christ for man's greatest disease, death. I cannot and will not stop talking about it. If I purchased a new car and saw in the owner's manual that it had a certain type of engine, I shouldn't be surprised to lift the hood and find the engine to be exactly as the manual said it would be. The maker's handbook gives me insight into unseen workings of the vehicle. This is also true of human beings. The maker's manual, the Bible, explains how we think and why we react the way we do. It lifts the hood and reveals our inner workings of humans. In doing so, the Bible discloses an often overlooked tool that we can use to reach the lost. The tool is the fear of death. For the Christian who may find such an approach to be negative, it may be viewed as a positive light by calling it the will to live. Every human being in, this, in the right mind has a fear of death, Hebrews 2.15. He doesn't want to die. He sits wide-eyed, staring out the window of the speeding train, watching his life pass him by. Here is how to use the fear of death as a tool when speaking to an unsafe person. Let's assume that the average person dies around 70 years old. And if you're 20 years old, you have 2,500 weekends left to live. If you've turned 30, you have 2,000 weekends left to live. If you're 40 years old, you have 1,500 weekends left. If you're 50 years old, then you have 1,000 weekends. If you're 60, you have about 500 weekends left until death comes to you. That's pretty sobering. And we, we can better relate to weekends. While years put death into the distance, it should make us enough to ask, what am I doing with my life? What are we doing to reach the lost? It should concern us uh, if we have dry eyes when we pray. The Christian's train will take him into the presence of God. For those trusting in Jesus, death has been defeated. But the train of the unregenerate will take them into horrific disaster. The end will be eternal torment in hell. In light of such terrible thoughts, all of our activities are trivial compared to warning the loss of their destination. It has been wisely stated that every one of us is unique, just like everyone else. In truth, each unique individual is uniquely predictable. Every sinner has a fear of death. We can't deny that he naturally has a will to live. Therefore, it makes sense to confront him with reality by reminding him that he has an appointment to keep. Bluntly tell him how many weekends he has remaining. Then appeal to his reasoning by saying, If there is one chance in a million that Jesus has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, then you owe it to your good sense to look into it. As Charles Spurgeon said, Men have been helped to live by remembering that they must die. Yeah, that, that is an immutable thing. You know, we're, we're all going to face that at one point. The great thing is, as Christians... We don't have to worry about death. We don't have to be afraid of it because when we die, we go on living. We pass from death. We don't even really feel death. We just immediately go and we're with the presence of the Lord, with our glorified body uh, in heaven, enjoying all that God has for us for all of eternity. <clears throat> uh, you know, Paul says in Philippians, 
to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Really, if you're a Christian, that, that's really the thing is. Really, death is just uh, where well, you get rid of this body and, and get a better body. And you don't have to worry about sin and sickness or bills or all those things. And you know what? People need to realize that there is a better thing for them. And Jesus Christ wants to do so much for them. So I hope you enjoyed these two lessons today. We'll be back in a few weeks with uh, the next two lessons. Have a great day. Remember, as always, that Jesus loves you, I love you, and you are awesome.